have a hub that I can actually place over this particular car and recalibrate, not calibrate, but just revalidate that you know my software is working correctly, that my uh, the, the wheels work the, the way, excuse me, the encoders work the way that I expect them to do. Um, the one thing that I did run into is that the distance, and I would do this a little bit different um, uh, next time, but the distance between the actual photodiodes and the actual encoder wheel itself um, is very important. And to get a perfect sine wave, what I found is just uh, taking a little bit of pencil lead on your finger and darkening up my encoder wheel was just a way that I can uh, fine tune uh, the performance of the actual encoder wheel. Um, <clears throat> so the Mark II system design is a little bit simpler. Um, uh, the brushless motor driver, for the moment, I'm just using as my throttle control, um, but it, it has its own uh, uh, microcontroller that I can take advantage of later. Um, the main thing that I did here is I implemented an FPGA. I want to talk about that in a second. Um, so I have four encoders um, uh, on this guy, and I knew I was going, and with, uh, I think it's 38 pulses per revolution, and I'm going to be driving very, very fast, um, so I'm going to get a lot of pulses. Um, the servo that I implemented previously using an AppMega 328, I only had 8-bit resolution, and that wasn't good enough. Like in between um, bits was uh, you know several degrees of of, uh, of turn. Um, so I knew I wanted a higher resolution there, um, and I knew that that if I can implement this using an FPGA, I can pretty much solve a number of these problems where uh, these things are just essentially come free. Uh, versus having to time slice those things out of a microprocessor, uh, um, something that I'd like to talk to you about. Um, so uh, the basic board design, um, you know, go to Oshpark, get yourself a, a, a board built out. That rat nest before was a good starting point, but you know the EMI issues were, were creeping in. So um, you know this was the just basic um, a prototype. You can see where things were kind of running out. The other thing, because I wanted a low center of mass. Um, uh, I looked at the actual um, hardware on the uh, race car itself and replaced a few of the basic components with an actual, I don't know, for lack of a better word, a motherboard that I 3D printed and replaced the main components, uh, or excuse me, the main base plate that was um, uh, above uh, the, the actual drive shaft. And this allowed me to put everything as low as possible and to integrate a, a, a roll cage without uh, you know, a lot of extra um, uh, you know, guff. <clears throat> So how am I going to do outside-in tracking? Um, uh, this became a passion for me because uh, remote stink. Uh, I'm a one person. I need to have somebody drive the car while I'm testing the car um, uh, and back and forth. So what I started looking into is what is the easiest way that I can do motion capture? So uh, you know, camera-based motion capture that like your Iron Man, whatever your Superman uh, 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 movies are using, those camera capture setups are, are multiple tens of thousands of dollars. Um, uh, they're not for the, the, the lay person. Uh, but these things are. So this is a, a Vive um, uh, Lighthouse rig that goes to the Vive uh, VR headset. Um, you can pick up uh, a Vive Lighthouse uh, a beacon uh, for, you know, at, when I was picking them up, they were $59.99 on uh, eBay. Um, it's, <laughs> Dirt cheap for what you're getting compared to tens of thousands of dollars for uh, motion control. Uh, you just need to know how to uh, how to use them. Uh, so the way that they work is um, <clears throat> basically you get a pulse of light and then a sweep in one direction, you know, horizontal, and then a sweep in the in the vertical. And you put two of these on two opposite sides of the of the volume that you want to track. Um, and whatever sensor actually picks up those um, pulses. Um, can tell where it is relative to the actual um, uh, beacon. So if, if I hear a pulse, I start counting how uh, long uh, I get another pulse from, and I know that you know, vertically uh, I'm this many degrees off of the actual lighthouse. So with a little bit of calibration, you can actually do some localization. Um, so this is just a very quick um, uh, kind of summary of it, but you, you basically get these a pulse and then a sweep. And anywhere within that sweep, um, you, you can calculate the, the, the direction that you're looking for, excuse me, the direction from the lighthouse that you're actually receiving, and you get this uh, at 30 hertz. Um, the uh, uh, easiest way for you guys to do this, don't go my way, maybe go my way, I don't know, um, uh, is to buy one of these Vive trackers. They're 99 bucks, they're, they're kind of expensive. They have a built in battery, they're, uh, they're um, 
uh, omnidirectional, so they'll, they'll capture in all directions. Um, these things are designed for you to, you know, because it's a VR headset for gaming, they're designed to go on top of your rifle or whatever, and, or your baseball bat. Um, so you can clobber zombies with this particular Vive tracker, um, or you can use an open source kit called Live Survive um, <clears throat> to receive the, the actual uh, pulse train from, from those devices. They'll actually, uh, with calibration, you can get positional tracking. And uh, what's really cool is this is Charlie, uh, Charles Lohr. Um, he kind of made it his mission to create a community around building an open source uh, library for, this, um, uh, for the Vive um, uh, tracking system. Uh, they've pretty much figured out a large portion of the problems that, that you'll run into, um, and it's a pretty much kind of straightforward implementation. In my case, this tracker is almost as tall as the mid portion of the of the car. Um, it's it's 98 grams. Um, it's a it's a big honking thing that would be on the top of the car, and I wasn't interested in that particularly. And I also don't need 360. I can you know I know that the car is always going to be on the ground, so I can use fewer sensors. Um, and solve the problem that way. Um, so I wanted to go, um, just to make life a little hard, um, uh, go about the, the process of actually um, uh, reading the sensor information from the beacons myself and um, building a system uh, to do it. It largely is based off of this diagram. Um, uh, you know, the basic work that these guys um, have done, you know, reading through the code and kind of understanding it, but implementing it using an FPGA. Um, so if you search for, um, uh, DIY uh, position sensor, um, or, or you know anything DIY vibe, uh, you'll come across uh, Alexander Shipkin's work. This is a great um, uh, low-end uh, implementation um, where he just has a, a circuit implementation that, that will uh, receive the actual pulses and then software that uh, is uh, that you can implement using an SDM32. Uh, uh, I think he's using a Tinsy in this case, um, and you can get a basic bearing from uh, a pre-calibrated um, service. So if you actually have the Vive um, uh, uh, set up with the VR headset and you can calibrate it within that environment, then you'll get a calibration, uh, you know, basically a, a set of matrices that you can then use with his kit and use this particular sensor and, and uh, play around with um, uh, play around with actually tracking something. Um, this didn't suit my purposes uh, because I don't own a Vive um, headset. I just bought the beacons. Um, and uh, you'll notice that on these, I built two of them, I played around with them. But the thing that I immediately found is that the resolution is greater um, than, than what you should be able to get with the system. So the Vive will track at sub-millimeter accuracy. Um, the, the fact that he's using three separate sensors that are spread far apart uh, immediately tells you that it's going to have to be about a centimeter and a half. Um, uh, so I wanted to look into, uh, you know, how could you implement these things. I, I built one just to actually play around with it. I was using an infrared remote just to make sure things were working correctly. Um, I was able to receive signals from my beacon. Um, it's a whole lot of fun. Uh, his implementation on the Tinsy um, works. If you have a calibrated environment, it's a, it's a way to go. Um, but I don't. So I went through the path of, of looking at, um, these are from Triad Semiconductor, they're uh, an actual ASIC that, um, uh, and sensor, and this is the actual development board that they provide where you can get power ground in the envelope, uh, that actual you know, uh, uh, step uh, function coming out of the, uh, that previous slide that I was showing you before. And this was a great way to just throw a couple sensors on my system and plug them directly into the FPGA. Um, so uh, I built a, a layout where I just have four of them. Um, in this case, it's it's a, just a box. Um, uh, it's just a flat plane. Um, so it, it's designed specifically such that the car needs to stay on the ground, and that's perfectly fine as long as you don't go airborne. I don't plan to go airborne, <laughs> so things are fine. Um, uh, and I just went through and I measured the distance between those um, sensors. Um, and I implemented the, the Vive tracking, uh, or excuse me, that Lighthouse tracking uh, implementation using the FPGA. So just then as another aside, highly recommend, start looking at FPGAs. Sounds like you guys are going to play with them next um, uh, session. Um, here's a little bit of a precursor of, of my ex experience. Um, so this guy, Clifford Wolf, um, about 2016, um, open sourced his tool chain for um, uh, programming the ICE-40 um, FPGA. You can pick these, uh, uh, they're a lattice part. Uh, you can pick up dev boards off of uh, Tindy for, I, I think, 38 bucks for this one. 
Um, they're uh, readily available now. Everybody's getting into the kind of the DOM piece of it. What's really cool is that the uh, the actual tool chain is, is pretty robust. Um, uh, it's impressive. I, I come from the uh, uh, Altera FPGAs. Um, uh, their tool chain is huge, gigabytes, and this is something that is uh, megabytes um, and does exactly what I needed to do. Maybe you can't do all of the simulation, but you certainly can do a lot of uh, what you'd expect. It's a great place to start, um, uh, and what it specifically allows you to do is implement things like uh, a servo um, module very, very quickly. So this is a 10-bit servo module. I needed 10 bits because I knew I needed I, you know, less than uh, you know, a full turn every time I, I uh, incremented a bit on my uh, uh, steering angle. And this is all that it takes to actually do in Verilog. Um, you're basically just using a clock input. Uh, you're using a value um, uh, to uh, offset the amount of time that you're going to send your pulse. Um, you're, you know, you're, you're doing PWM. Uh, but what's really amazing is you can stamp these out. And for every uh, I.O. pin, um, you could pretty much implement a servo driver uh, by just stamping out this particular um, uh, uh, piece of, of code here. And there's not a constraint uh, where, you know, for example, your microcontroller, where you can only do so many things in a cycle. This stuff happens entirely in parallel um, and allows you to do um, uh, a lot of very simple work, but entirely in parallel. And that's what's really cool. So what I'm showing here is the actual Verilog code, and then the way that you debug FPGAs is actually to look at the, the output of the stimulus. So I'm stimulating the system by entering in a clock and uh, a value, and uh, I'm reading back the, um, uh, the pulse width modulation that I expect uh, to go out to the actual servo, um, and I can actually look at the number of counts that it's counting up to to actually do that step transition. And that's extremely, I mean, it's, it's close to debugging as you'll ever get um, uh, with something that's entirely happening inside the hardware. Um, so this is actually an, uh, a, a view of the Lighthouse sensor board. In this case, I can stamp out five of them. Um, uh, and uh, in each one of these, you can see the actual flash pulse and then the <coughs> position pulse, and this is entirely something that I can simulate. And then on the other side, I actually implemented an SBI bus, and that's how I read it out of the actual car itself. Um, so what that all turns into, coming to an end, um, uh, is the if you look at the lighthouse uh, from, from a perspective of how you're going to do localization or how it actually works, the easiest way to think about it is that it's it's like a uh, it's it's like the camera perspective point problem, where you're trying to find where is the camera in relationship to a set of an image or a set of points. So you guys ever see that? Uh, I think Microsoft did that uh, picture of a cathedral where they remapped an entire um, uh, uh, cathedral just by looking at Flickr photos. It was able to kind of re uh, kind of. Uh, recompile an actual um, 3D model of the actual cathedral itself. It's the same problem. It's a well-researched um, uh, uh, problem. And the lighthouse is the same thing, but just inverted. So you, you are, um, the, the camera itself um, is, is uh, you can think of the actual beacon itself as a uh, camera with a focal point of one. Um, and uh, there are a number of algorithms that you can take um, and actually um, uh, use to actually do the point uh, problem. In my case, I'm using uh, EPMP to get a basic rough estimate of where the camera is in perspective to my, uh, my calibrated um, uh, object. So for example, this thing. Um, and then uh, later you can use MPFIT to actually do the least squares to, um, to fine tune that, that actual model itself. A little technical, I'm sorry. Um, this is the end of the talk. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, this works perfectly as long as the car is airborne. Uh, it is not airborne um, <laughs> because I'm only using um, four sensors and only expecting it to stay on the ground in, in general. Um, if you intend to do it with a quadcopter or whatever, you would have to use more sensors like you were seeing with the Vibe Tracker. But if you make that compromise, then the problem is really just where am I in X, Y, and then theta. Where am I turned on the actual surface? Um, so again, i got to qualify everything, so I built a little gantry and was able to kind of drive this sensor around and, and pull back uh, the data based on um, my expectation of where it should be um, uh, X and Y and uh, you know, be able to read in the actual um, beacon uh, data and know that you know, my, my implementation is working as I expect. So with this setup, I can get millimeter, sub-millimeter accuracy. Um, 
which is pretty phenomenal, um, I think, for something that's so relatively uh, inexpensive compared to like what the industry is actually going around. <clears throat> okay, so final demo of the day is uh, just a, a video. This is kind of cobbled together, so I, I apologize. But this is a set of software um, driving the car uh, somewhat autonomously. So you can actually see that the, up in the top right corners, you can see the gnomons that are pointing where the cameras, uh, excuse me, where the lighthouses are. And they're, uh, they're receiving, or at least the, the sensors in the middle, this little point there, is where the, the sensors are receiving the actual beacons. And that little yellow piece is um, the planned, excuse me, planned route of uh, where the car should go. And the idea that I'm working on currently is actually, you can see this uh, again, so there's a little bit of jitter. Um, this is again still within a millimeter accuracy. Um, the Calvin filthy clean that up uh, real good. Um, and this is just it driving a little bit forward and me just making sure that the, you know, it's working the way that I expect it to. So I'm able to just push a button, um, drive it back into place, and then make sure that things are working correctly. So there's another um, slide where I can show a little bit of it doing um, some of the self-driving. Uh, there's just a little bit of it, um, uh, just in a second. So this blue line is doing the cross-track error, find, trying to uh, line itself up on that um, uh, yellow line itself. And uh, as I kind of move this around, it's, it's kind of uh, re-simulating where it should actually go. And then uh, I'll go off and I'll actually uh, pull the trigger and have it drive just a little bit. Um, and that's, uh, that's pretty much where I'm at at this point. Um, the, the main thrust of what I'm trying to do at this point is have it drive around um, as, as creepy crawly as it, as it can and then increase the speed as, pop, you know, as I can um, and use that outside in tracking to give me a ground truth so that I can start the process of using um, uh, inside out. Ooh, okay, so uh, I think I'm going to hit the gas in a second. Um, while we're waiting for this, uh, any questions? Oh, did you see it drive? Is, is, this, is this trait, is this training now? So 